In the opening years of the Second World War, few weapons struck fear into the hearts of soldiers and civilians alike, as much as the Ju-87 Stuka. Engineered for precision, designed to instill fear, the Junkers Ju-87 wasn't just a dive bomber, it was a flying machine built around one mission, to hit targets with deadly accuracy from a near-vertical dive. From its distinctive inverted gull wings to its dive brakes and automatic pullout system, every feature of the Ju-87 was engineered to strike with pinpoint accuracy from the sky. Capable of diving at speeds over 350 miles per hour and hitting targets within 30 meters, the Stuka could unleash destruction with mechanical precision, then recover from the dive under crushing G-forces, often without the pilot even touching the controls. But was the Stuka really a triumph of precision engineering, or an outdated tool in a rapidly evolving war? In this episode, we uncover the full story of the Ju-87 dive bomber, how it was designed, how it operated, and how it left its mark on the battlefields of World War II. Dive bombing emerged as a tactical solution to a timeless problem in military aviation how to accurately strike a point target, like a warship, artillery position, or fortification from a fast-moving aircraft. In the pre-guided weapons era, when most tactical aircraft carried only small, unguided bombs, precision was elusive. The concept of dive bombing wasn't born in Germany. The British experimented with shallow dive attacks during World War I, and both the United States and Japan explored dive delivery methods during the interwar years. But it was the Germans, through the development of the Junkers Ju-87 Stuka, who refined the tactic to an unprecedented and unmatched level. The appeal of the dive bombing method was simple, accuracy. Imagine trying to drop a golf ball into the hole while sprinting across the green, that's horizontal bombing. Now imagine hovering directly above the hole and releasing the ball straight down. That's dive bombing. The steeper the dive, the less the bomb's path is affected by wind, speed, or altitude. It simply follows the trajectory of the aircraft itself. What made the Stuka unique wasn't just its ability to dive. It was its ability to dive almost vertically, then pull out without breaking apart. That near-vertical approach meant the bomb followed a direct line from the bomber to the target. Tanks, ships, bunkers, if the pilot could aim the aircraft, he could hit them with ruthless precision. Unlike most aircraft of its time, the Stuka could perform a near-vertical dive without surpassing its never-exceed speed, a dangerous threshold many other bombers couldn't approach safely. While most dive bombers maxed out around a 70-degree dive angle, the Ju-87 routinely went steeper. Only a few aircraft, like the American Vulti Vengeance, were said to match its true vertical capability. Key to this performance were the Stuka's distinctive underwing dive brakes, a remarkably simple yet effective innovation credited to Hugo Junkers. These small, Curved metal plates generated drag and stabilized the aircraft during descent, preventing it from accelerating uncontrollably. The standard loadout was a single 250 or 500 kilograms bomb beneath the fuselage and smaller 50 kilograms bombs under each wing. The release was synchronized with a mechanism that swung the bomb clear of the propeller arc. This precise release system paired with the vertical dive angle, turned the Stuka into a flying sniper rifle. To magnify its terror effect, early Stukas were equipped with a wind-driven siren called the Jericho Trumpet. While it added drag and was later removed, its psychological impact was enormous. Allied troops nicknamed the Stuka's attack, the Scream of Death. Aerodynamically, the Ju-87 was no sleek machine. Its chin radiator, 
fixed landing gear with large wool pants, and tall greenhouse-style cockpit, weren't streamlined, but in this case that worked in its favor. All that drag helped cap the aircraft's vertical dive speed at around 375 miles per hour, with later variants capable of diving safely at over 400 miles per hour. Executing a Stuka dive wasn't just about flying steep. It demanded precision, nerves of steel, and physical endurance. To enter the dive, some Ju-87 pilots would half-roll the aircraft onto its back, then pull positive Gs to tip into a near-vertical plunge. Others simply pushed forward from level flight into the dive. Either way, it was a violent maneuver. With the aircraft pitched steeply downward, pilots often had to brace themselves by pressing hard on the rudder pedals to avoid smashing into the instrument panel, even with the support of a shoulder harness. And while holding that position, they also had to ignore flak bursts and incoming fire, all while keeping the target perfectly in sight. The Stuka's design helped. A small window in the cockpit floor allowed pilots to spot and fix targets before rolling into the dive, sometimes at angles as steep as 90 degrees. As the aircraft pitched over, underwing dive brakes automatically deployed, limiting the dive speed to around 350 miles per hour. This bought the pilot precious seconds to line up the attack. In dive mode, the flight controls became more responsive and etched reference lines on the canopy helped pilots maintain the correct dive angle. The final moments before release were a high-stakes calculation of angle, altitude, and timing. The Stuka's iconic sirens, mechanically driven by airflow over small propellers mounted on the landing gear, were an early tool of psychological warfare designed to instill panic during a dive. However, their aerodynamic drag reduced dive speeds by 5 to 10 percent. As operational demands grew, Luftwaffe crews increasingly removed the sirens to improve performance and bombing accuracy. One of the most innovative features of the Ju-87 Stuka was its automatic pull-out mechanism, an advanced safety system for its time. Dive bombing was physically demanding and dangerous. As pilots focused intensely on their target, they risked target fixation waiting too long to pull up or blacking out from the extreme g-forces of the recovery. The automatic pullout was designed to solve both. The system was entirely hydraulic and mechanical. Before beginning a dive, the pilot trimmed the aircraft nose down to stabilize the steep descent. Once the bomb was released, the mechanism automatically neutralized the trim tab, commanding the aircraft into a pullout that exerted between 5 and 6 Gs on the crew. In an era long before G-suits or high-performance anti-G techniques, many pilots and rear gunners would experience temporary tunnel vision or blackout, but crucially, the aircraft would recover on its own, at least in theory. However, many Stuka pilots didn't trust the system. During early training exercises over the Baltic Sea, several aircraft dove into the water when the mechanism failed or the pilot hesitated. Incidents like these led some crews to disable the feature entirely, preferring the risks of manual control over a system they didn't fully trust. The pullout phase was also when the Ju-87 was at its most vulnerable. Slowed by the dive brakes and climbing back to altitude along a predictable arc, it became easy prey for enemy fighters. Allied pilots quickly learned not to chase the diving Stuka. Instead, they waited for the moment it released its bombs and began to recover. That's when they struck. The Ju-87 Stuka was never meant to face enemy fighters alone. It was designed to operate under the umbrella of total air superiority, where it could perform precise bomb runs unchallenged. But when that protection vanished, as it did over Britain and later on the Eastern Front, 
the vulnerabilities of even the most finely tuned dive bomber became painfully clear. The fearsome reputation the Ju-87 earned during the early Blitzkrieg campaigns proved short-lived. During the Battle of Britain in 1940, the Stuka was thrown into a role it was never designed to fulfill, strategic bombing. Sluggish, underarmed, and vulnerable to fighter attack, the Stuka was picked off in droves by RAF Spitfires and Hurricanes. Within weeks, it became clear that Germany's vaunted dive bomber, so effective in Poland and France, was hopelessly outmatched in skies, where the Luftwaffe lacked air superiority. The Stuka was built for a very different kind of war. It was a tactical support aircraft, meant to fly low and slow alongside advancing German tanks, Blitzkrieg's flying artillery, not a tool for bombing cities from altitude. In North Africa, the story was no different. By the time of the Second Battle of El Alamein in late 1942, the Luftwaffe was overstretched and fuel-starved. Allied air power, particularly RAF and South African Air Force Kitty Hawks, dominated the skies. German fighters like the Messerschmitt Bf 109 and Italian Mackie MC.202 could no longer protect the slow, vulnerable Stukas. As a result, the Ju-87s were largely absent from one of the largest armored battles of the war, a battlefield where they might otherwise have thrived. Without air superiority, the Stuka was no longer a weapon of terror or precision, it was a flying target. After the debacle of the Battle of Britain, the Royal Air Force confidently declared the Stuka obsolete, a spent force beaten into retreat by fast, nimble spitfires and hurricanes. The narrative stuck. In the years since, that story became part of the Stuka's mythos, so much so that one British historian remarked, more nonsense has been written about the Stuka than about any other airplane in history. But history tells a different tale. In the five years that followed the Battle of Britain, the Stuka proved time and again that it was far from finished. Over the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and especially the Eastern Front, it remained one of the most effective tactical strike aircraft of the war. It was credited with sinking hundreds of thousands of tons of Allied shipping, damaging and destroying multiple warships, and eliminating thousands of Soviet tanks in close air support missions. Far from a relic, the Stuka evolved, refitted, rearmed, and redeployed in ways that suited its original role, surgical battlefield precision in support of ground forces. Its ability to hit specific targets under the right conditions remained unmatched, well into the later years of the war. The Stuka's legacy as the most iconic dive bomber in history remains, not just for the destruction it caused, but for the ruthless precision with which it delivered it.